Welcome everyone to the leadership panel for this um, GovCamp today. I'm really honoured to be able to facilitate uh, the discussion on public sector innovation and open government. And we have a wonderful group of leaders. Very honoured to have you gentlemen all here. Um, Professor John McMillan, who's the Australian Government's Information Commissioner. David Tune, Secretary of the Department of Finance and Deregulation. David Frick. Fricker, the Director General of the National Archives of Australia, Drew Clark, Secretary of the Department of Broadband Communication and Digital Economy, and Michael Chisnell, who's the ACT Government from the ACT Government's Information Office and is the Executive Director there. Um, we've got an hour all up to actually have the conversation and in a design thinking approach, this is one of the beginning sorts of elements, the strategic conversation that tries to sort of capture context and influence and issues in the sort of sphere of leading the way in um, public sector innovation, as well as what we're wanting to canvas is the issues and opportunities. So where we've come from, the sort of the key strategic questions really, where have we come from, where are we now and where are we heading? Between them, our panel has a brilliant um, depth and richness of experience and stories, I'm sure, whether we'll get them out of them today, we'll find out. They've performed a range of roles in public and private sectors, even in Antarctica, customs, security, the handling of citizen complaints, building energy policy, um, new families work and welfare policy, not to mention serving a number of governments, ministers, and handling that sort of awkward issue in terms of ranges of expectations of citizens, governments, stakeholders, staff, introducing and developing new policies and structures and sorting through the old ones. So let's see what innovation means to them. Um, it's many forms, enabling environments that make it work easier or not. The toolkits, who are the change makers? Diffusion methods, because you can have great ideas as we've learnt today, but actually making them stick is another matter. Burning platforms, etc. It can be revolutionary like the impact of social media in the Arab Spring uprisings or even disaster management in Queensland, but it can also be very helpful and useful if it's incremental. From today's conversations, it's key to Australia's productivity. It's collaborative, it's based on and around people, their behaviours, their choices, their patterns and their pain points. It's open, it relies on data and information, the courage to challenge the status quo, an outside in perspective, the awareness that the borders and the spaghetti of rules in government and the various layers of responsibility are not easily understood and navigated and usually get in the way of getting things done. An ability to em emphasise and wear the shoes of citizens, looking beyond the organisation for ideas, as um, Senator Lundy said, the ecosystem, the value network or chain, and exploiting the opportunities of a digital future taking an experimental approach to risk and an acceptance of the potential for intelligent failure and it, and it needs nurturing. And these are all fairly challenging statements. It can also happen anywhere and actually by anyone. Um, and it's advanced and amplified by competence and commitment of leaders. And we have a few in front of you today. Peter Senge said that leadership exists when people are no longer victims of circumstances but participate in creating new circumstances. Ultimately, leadership is about creating new realities. So we have a great panel to dissect and reflect and create a picture of this future that we're moving to and to canvas the nature of public sector innovation and to answer these strategic questions. Where have we been and what have we learnt? Where are we now? And what are the possibilities of a future that embraces public sector innovation? And how are we going to get there? And what will be different? So let's um, hang on to the next hour. Be our panel's going to be reflective in considering all of the issues that is the basket of challenge of leaders as to 
uh, where we've come from. None of us have gained these wrinkles without hopefully them being a benefit to others um, beyond the cosmetic surgeons. And um, we also encourage the panel to um, conceive of what we're facing over the next few months and years and what that actually means to the nature of how we um, drive for the changes and improve the outcomes that we in the public sector are keen to achieve. So with that as a sort of a, a basic intro, could I ask um, the panellists to actually give a brief sort of consideration of um, the issues that from their perspective and what, uh, who better than to start as, um, in sort of reflecting on where we've come from, um, the Director General of National Archives, David Fricker. I have, very good. <laughs> um, look, thank you, Jane, and uh, yes, thanks for giving me the honour of, um, of going first and talking about the past <laughs> um, at this you know, discussion about innovation in the future. <laughs> but look, um, just as a scene setter, I guess, what, what it is um, quite useful, I think, to reflect on some aspects of the past and, and where, we've, where we're coming from, if you like, in terms of uh, the base upon which we're, we're striving for innovation in delivery of public services in particular. Um, coming from the National Archives, not surprisingly, uh, my focus is on information, uh, the management of information and the delivery of information, and information as, uh, as the, the fuel that uh, empowers you know, the delivery, the, the construction, the creation and delivery of services. And, um, and I think if, if we do reflect on, on the past and some of the, the, the breakthroughs that we're looking for, um, I, I do believe that uh, the, the traditional way of constructing and delivering services from government has been very much this uh, left, left to right thinking, you know, start to finish thinking. And so we would start with a government policy or a piece of legislation and uh, then from there we would de de determine how a particular you know, what, what Department of State should be allocated the responsibility for this, uh, this thing. Uh, that Department of State would uh, rally its own resources within its own um, uh, remit and it would then construct uh, a sort of a section or a team to do that. It might uh, de develop a new database uh, that they could use to, um, you know, produce the reports and the, the information to deliver that thing. That department would then find its own supply chain and it would identify its own end end users and its clients. Um, all of it, you know, self-contained, very narrow, very sort of start to finish thinking. In, in this sort of um, scenario, the, the citizen out there is, is often, was often viewed as a blank canvas. You know, the, the, that citizen is not thinking about anything other than receiving this particular service from this agency because of this piece of legislation or this piece of policy. So it was very much a narrow sort of blank page uh, and a very one-dimensional view of the citizen, um, what what uh, would be you know the the restrictions on all of that was that you would be then encumbered with having to come up with every part of the supply chain to get that service out there. It was quite expensive. Uh, you had to rely on your own. Uh, there was no idea of a sort of a much of an idea anyway of a delivery network to to put that out there. Um, typically, it wasn't. Um, uh, much of a sort of a partnership model where you might think about partnering with either not-for-profits or with uh, the commercial sector or the corporate sector to deliver that thing. Certainly nothing like we're now thinking about in terms of information portals and apps and uh, an information marketplace to leverage off to deliver those services. From an information point of view, the information was not always that useful. It was in a proprietary format. It was constructed around this particular departmental database. Uh, there were no sort of ideas about metadata standards or anything like that that would, um, that would enable it to be interoperable or, or any of those sorts of things. So it was quite a narrow cast um, service design and delivery. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm coming up with lots of negatives here and I suppose I'm throwing out lots of hints in terms of where the breakthroughs are that we're now finding and, and delivering on. Um, some strengths, though, that we've had for some time, um, some, you know, traditions within the, the public service, within the public sector, uh, have been for some time, you know, um, the respect for information, the respect for ideals of accountability in government, the, the respect of the ideals of public service, of doing the right things by our citizenry and by the, the public in general. And so the, the if you like, those uh, altruistic standards and those ideals and those, those laws, those codes, 
etc. and that sense of accountability have always been there. Uh, and I think on those sort of traditions and values we're sort of now building on, uh, enabling uh, much more information to be out there, enabling much more partnerships to be formed in order to deliver those services and much more creativity in the design of a service with the citizen in mind as opposed to how the, the public service, how we've constructed ourselves as departments of state or or agencies, etc. So I think if, you know, I'll stop there so that, we, you know, we give some oxygen to other speakers, but um, uh, I think for me that sort of characterises the past in terms of the design and delivery of public services and, and it's, it's, a lot of that is hinging on what I was describing as our vision often in the past about the end user of the service. You know, the designers of the services, we wouldn't often think of them in a holistic sense, we would have very much this, this blank canvas sort of point of view, that individual is out there, they're helpless, I need to do everything to get to them and deliver this service uh, and they're not thinking about anything else other than the service that I'm delivering and for that sort of reason. Uh, and so that's sort of the, the narrow view that I think, you know, if we look well back in the past. I think right now today we've come a fair way off that uh, rather low base, but still I think they're the areas we should be thinking about when we're seeking true innovation in the way that we deliver those services. So thank you, Jane. Thank you. Perhaps we could move to John. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. The first role of a speaker in the final talking session of the, the day is to thank you all for staying for the final session, particularly when I think the average age of the panellists in this session is higher than the average age in any other session, so I at least am thankful that you've all stayed. Um, I'm delighted that the organisers of GovCamp have astutely arranged a session that links public sector innovation and open government. The earlier sessions in the conference will have established the clear link between them. And the link is also recognised in a large number of government reports and statements. I'll refer to some that explicitly draw the link and then mention some that don't draw the link. Well, firstly, some that do draw the link. Three just this month, sorry, last month in May. Um, the New South Wales Government Open Data Policy, their consultation draft said, open data supports the open government principles of transparency, participation, collaboration and innovation. Open data principles promote the development of new businesses and industries that can make use of open data. Secondly, um, last month, President President Obama um, issued a new executive order entitled Making Open and Machine Readable the New Default for Government Information. And he said, President, the opening line of uh, President Obama's uh, new executive order was, openness in government strengthens our democracy, promotes the delivery of efficient and effective services to the public and contributes to economic growth. As one vital benefit of open government, Making information resources easy to find, accessible and usable can fuel entrepreneurship, innovation and scientific discovery that improves Americans' lives and contributes significantly to job creation. Another report last month in the United Kingdom, the Shakespeare Report to Government, on, called an independent review of public sector information. It says, the next phase of economic, scientific and social development has data as its core. To optimise its value to society, data must be open, shareable, and where practical, it should be free. If we go back to last year, we can find many similar statements. For example, the Canadian government's open action plan, um, a plan on open government. It says Canada's, the opening line again is Canada's commitment to open government is part of the federal government's efforts to foster greater openness and accountability, to provide Canadians with more opportunities to learn about and participate in government, to drive innovation and economic opportunities for all Canadians while creating a more cost efficient, um, a cost effective, efficient and responsive government. Also last year, the, the Victorian government data Vic access policy. Um, its intent, as stated, is to enable public access to government data to support research and education, promote innovation, support improvements in productivity and stimulate growth in the Victorian economy. You'll have noticed by now that all the government statements I referred to are from foreign governments or Australian state governments. Can we identify similar statements by the national government in Australia? We have to trace back to 2009 to find any explicit link drawn between public sector innovation and open government. Um, there have been reports in the interim about innovation that, for example, have not mentioned that link. For example, 
the Australian Public Service Innovation, Innovation Action Plan in 2011 makes no mention of open government. Uh, it drew from an earlier report of the Management Advisory Committee, a report of 150 pages called Empowering Change, Fostering Innovation in the Australian Public Service. There's a lot in the report about open processes, open doors and open minds, but no mention of open government. Um, uh, a couple of uh, uh, months ago, the um, AGMO's Big Data um, uh, um, issues paper, Strategy Issues Paper, which is an excellent paper uh, that contains a lot about the value of big data, but the phrase open government um, is not mentioned there. Well, why do I draw these comparisons? Because at the national level in Australia, we have very strong policies on innovation. We have very strong policies and legislative declarations on open government. But we have nothing in recent times from uh, at the national level of government to draw a link between the two. We are missing an opportunity in failing to link the two. Uh, we miss an opportunity um, to add extra support for an innovation policy. We miss an opportunity to develop a comprehensive definition of open government. We allow irritations about, for example, the Freedom of Information Act, which I administer, to cloud all discussion of open government at the national level in Australia. And that's why I welcome the announcement uh, last month by the Attorney General that Australia will join nearly 60 other nations in a multilateral open government partnership. Um, Australia, for that purpose, will have to prepare a national action plan on open government, and this will give us an excellent opportunity to draw all of these strands of innovation, data, and open government and citizen engagement together in a single coherent plan that provides a good path ahead for Australia and the Australian business and, uh, and individual community. Thanks for the opportunity to share those thoughts. Thank you. Mick, Michael, I mean. <laughs> Mick, I do. <laughs> Um, I'm going to take a slightly different tack on this um, because I was actually thinking about what, what innovation actually is and, and why, why we should actually be talking about it here at this GovCam. Um, I think innovation, a bit like, you know, it can easily become like a motherhood statement, like education is good, innovation is good. Um, and we sort of bandy the word around um, as if we sort of understand exactly what it is. And I just wanted to maybe nail that down a bit. There is an assumption that governments need more of it, whatever it is. Uh, and that presumably that we need more of it than we need less of some other things. It's, it's probably a better thing to be going after than predictability or stability or solidity, which have been things that governments have rather favoured in the past. I asked the question, you know, what problem does it actually solve? I mean, I mean why are we doing this? It seems to me that innovation is, is about new things and ideas. And that links me back to my question I have myself about why am I a public servant? And what, I, what, what am I supposed to be doing? And what is the public service supposed to be doing? And I, and I think that there are only two possible business cases for spending money or doing anything in the public service. And that is one, that it somehow betters the community. And one, two, that it's less expensive. And, for that, actually, C1. Um, really, we're about trying to make things better. So innovation, presumably, is about trying to make things better, and trying to think, make things more efficient or wa less wasteful. But innovation is a particularly human exercise. Um, we have big brains as a species. Our, our babies, uh, our children, work in counterfactuals in ways that other species simply don't. Um, my son, I had the privilege of watching him to learn to climb downstairs when he was very little. And he sort of stumbled initially and then he found one way of doing it and on his back and then, then he found another way of doing it on his front and actually he found about five or six different ways of doing it um, because that's what we do. You know, that's the way humans are. We learn in that way. We innovate. Um, so my question really today is, is, 
if government isn't innovating, well, why not? I mean, that's what humans do. That's what our species are good at. So I think that in breaking that down, when we start thinking about innovation, innovation means experimentation. And with experimentation comes, as has been mentioned before, the risk of failure. When you think about the way we conceptualise projects in government um, and projects, the axis, we all know, it's the, the, their time, their cost and their scope. But typically, we announce a project at a cost and an end date, so it means that the scope from the outset is already constrained. Goodbye innovation. What would happen to, if, if, to a toddler if we didn't let him try to walk? He probably wouldn't end up walking. So experimentation is part of what it is to be human. So I, there's a few things that I would then say governments need to do. They need to experiment because humans need to experiment and learn. We need to commit manageable amounts of funding to experimentation, not put the whole budget on the third at Randwick, but manageable amounts. That we have to understand the difference between ICT and service informatics. They're very, very different. We have to find sandpits to play with industry and research. And the one that we have in this town, and generally NICTA e-government cluster is one of those. If we didn't have it, we needed to invent it. We need to find the energy and freedom that we find in GovHack last weekend. And the excitement. We need to unashamedly fail sometimes and ce celebrate successes at other times. And we need to free up and discuss this openly with the community. We need to move from hierarchical decision making to network decision making, as been talked before. We need to stop simply playing the role of outrage, uh, outrage content to the media. That what we do when we fail is cause for outrage and is content for the angry beast. We stop, need to stop announcing the unknowable. These lessons were learned a long time ago by successful organisations. The power of disruptive thinking and was what, what actually very... Yesterday we had the budget breakfast and I'm glad to say that our treasurer, as an aside, said something like, well, we need to engage in a little bit more organised chaos and that's what I think we need to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Drew. Okay, thank you, Jane, and thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to talk. I want to uh, talk about, uh, briefly touch on six points. So if you're taking notes on this, you only need to allow six lines. <laughs> um, and if, if you are, <laughs> thank you, David. Uh, <laughs> And th these are transformations, uh, transformations in progress, which, which I think are affecting government innovation, driving government innovation, creating opportunities for government information. So stuff that's happening now that I think is relevant. Um, and the first that, that segues very closely out of uh, John McMillan's remarks in the open data, open access area, a particular interest of mine is open access to, to government authoritative foundation spatial data uh, and this is something I've been working with Helen Owens in the audience today from the Office of Spatial Policy on for a couple of years and the, one of the interesting things about spatial data in the open data area is that it's actually a federal problem it's a Commonwealth state territory issue that the, fa the foundation data we need can't be made by any one government alone in our nine governments it actually needs the nine governments to cooperate for much of it and so tack tackling this problem of an open data model in a federal, in, in a federation is proven quite challenging because of course someone still has to pay for the cost of the, uh, the data and in the current budget environment that can be difficult. The policy trends that John has outlined of course are favourable to doing it but federation complicates it. Uh, we're getting there. We've defined 10 data themes, we're working through the details uh, but it's, um, it's not easy. Uh, second, uh, I want to highlight 
uh, a project currently underway between the Public Service Commission and my department on teleworking. Now, teleworking is not the same as home-based work, of course, and I think some staff or HR practitioners confuse the two. Teleworking doesn't assume that you're near full-time at home. It says you're spending some of the time working from somewhere else using modern uh, ICT uh, technologies. Seven agencies are trialling teleworking where staff are currently in the National Broadband Network footprint and there's a very extensive evaluation process for them, for their own workplace and how it's actually going and this will report back in uh, early 2014. But one of the things that's very clear already out of the trial is that the teleworking environment doesn't create new workplace problems but it can amplify existing workplace problems and issues around communication, collaboration, performance management, all workplaces grapple with those issues but when you chuck teleworking into the mix it can amplify it. So the problem is, the, well the response I think will not be well let's give up on teleworking but let's have well performing workplaces where teleworking will in fact yield uh, the productivity and other benefits that are available to it. Uh, third, I want to talk about uh, a dimension of the National Broadband Network that's not getting reported on the front page of various newspapers every day at the moment, and that's around the actual uptake of households for which the NBN is available. And the early results are really very, uh, very exciting and particularly from a strategic policy perspective. In areas where the NBN has been available for six months, the average uptake is now 33%. Uh, and that's ahead of the curve that we're looking for. Some areas after one to two years were already at 50 to 65% uptake of people coming on board. 30% of the users are buying the 100 uh, meg up 40, uh, sorry, 100 meg down, 40 meg up package. 30% are buying performance uh, at the, the high end of the spectrum and of course the even bigger performance characteristics are still to come. So this is a, a relatively fast uptake rate uh, even by Australian standards compared to other technologies and certainly on a worldwide scale. So you've got to be thinking about ubiquitous high speed broadband access for all citizens as a starting point for ICT innovation in the future. Fourth, uh, the rise of mobiles, you know, smartphones and tablets and so on. Uh, in uh, the middle of 2011, 25% of Australians had smartphones. 12 months later, it was 50%. Uh, what is it now, 12 months further on? Uh, global, global mobile traffic uh, in 2008 was 1% of the internet. Uh, today, it's 15% of the internet and still accelerating. So you know, the reality that our online offerings, products and services uh, is, you know, if you're not, if it doesn't work in the mobile technology, then you're, you're going to miss such a huge amount. People working in this space know it, but it's a phenomena whose impact I don't think we've, we've fully appreciated yet. Five, social media. Given the average age, I'm talking the bleeding obvious, but for old blokes in dark suits, uh, it's, it's really quite a stunning phenomena, the rate at which it's happened. Two thirds of Australian internet users uh, use social media. You know, I'm in the other third. Uh, and, but it's, it's the use, it's the way it's used and what it means. Now, social media is of course, in some ways a misnomer. It is a very commercial marketplace. Um, Facebook is on track to earn $6 billion this year with its over 1 billion users worldwide. 60% uh, of users log in and access the system daily. Uh, this has got policy implications that we're struggling with around uh, safety, security, privacy, etc. But how this really plays out in citizen engagement for government, I think we're still at the very early stages of it. The actual technology itself, I think, is still at the early stages. And this, this is, you know, it's a truism, but I, I just don't think we know where that's going to end and how that's going to unfold yet. And my final one, Jane, is crowdsourcing. Uh, in that I think uh, 
uh, crowdsourcing is probably in the arc of uh, this, this space, is still at the early stages. Uh, and of course there are some examples that are well known. It's also of course not a new phenomenon. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary uh, used crowdsourcing for some 70 years and got six million submissions from the population on words and their usage, you know, that were written on postcards and mailed in. Uh, one could argue that in Australia we're about to exercise a crowdsourcing thing called democracy, uh, mandatory crowdsourcing. But, you know, the, the current examples of uh, using crowdsourcing for capital raising for new innovation. Uh, Google using crowdsourcing to get more reliable mapping information. Uh, the, uh, the commercial side of Facebook effectively crowdsourcing their value out of what their users do uh, on that platform are all examples of it. So it's this sense of citizens becoming workers uh, and that we're not paying for that work but they're doing it. And to circle back to my first remark about authoritative government data, my interest spatial, but the, the ex exercise applies generally. Well, users are gonna create a crowdsourced version of those databases regardless of what government does. And when we get efficient open access to those data, they're gonna mash that up with crowdsourced data and we government will completely lose control of it and some of us will feel uncomfortable about that, but that's gonna be the reality. So there are six issues that I see today that are driving it. Uh, it would be interesting to say in 12 months would they be the same six? And maybe, so maybe some of them had survived, maybe some are mainstream, but I'll bet you in 24 months it would be a significantly different list. Thanks, Drew. And David. Thanks, Jane. Um, looking at the panel around here, I thought all the suits are up here for this session, so uh, and you're probably thinking to yourself, what does the Department of Finance and Deregulation have to add to this uh, discussion? And uh, so what I don't want to go through what the Department of Finance and Dereg does. Um, you probably know that AGMO sits within the, the organisation and plays an active role in this area. But I thought I might try and pick up a couple of the things that the others have said and see if I can put a bit of context of it around them and, and perhaps a, my own personal viewpoint to some extent as well. Um, John's comments, he was reading out the various overseas reports linking innovation and, and, and open government, which is a fair cop. Uh, one you didn't mention, John, which I think is worth reflecting on is Gov 2.0 from a few years ago, which was... was yep, that was it, sorry. Which in a sense was quite an important document. Uh, it uh, came out soon after I became Secretary of the Department. And uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't have a clue what Gov 2.0 meant when I joined the Department of Finance, but I was soon taught. And actually became quite interested in the concept because it really is about um, using data, uh, being innovative in the way we use data, thinking about the citizen, the citizen-centric approach to delivery of, of government services, uh, participatory democracy, all the sorts of issues, some of the issues that Drew, uh, drew on just a moment ago. And it was trying to bring that together into a new way of thinking about the way government operates. And at the time, it had a fairly, well, it had a strong supporter, in, in fact, in, the, in terms of the, the then Minister for Finance, who was Lindsay Tenner, who was pushing it quite hard. And, uh, and through AGIMO, we made quite a bit of progress. But at the same time, we had quite a few roadblocks put in front of us. There were people who were scared of things like, you know, public servants blogging. There were people scared if we put uh, government data onto something called, you know, data.gov.au that uh, suddenly the people of the country might be able to find out what's going on in the world and be able to manipulate the data, what's even worse, to actually do their own analysis. So there's been, you know, a little bit, there's been uptake and negatives about this as we've moved forward. And, and I don't think we've had a revolution, but I think we've had an evolution over the last three to four years where these things have become much more accepted, particularly within the public service itself. And people outside the public service, of course, have been crying out for these things. So we have had, you know, as I just mentioned, data.gov.au. We've got blogs going on. We run our own blogs inside the, uh, in the department where public servants, senior public servants at that, have been blogging away on all sorts of issues for the last few years. And whilst some people feared that this would then end us up in the soup and we'd be in major trouble because a public servant would make an inappropriate comment, the fact of the matter is that it hasn't happened. 
and, uh, and people have been responsible in the way they've been using the blogs inside the public service. They're able to make the, make the distinction between their own private views and the professional views they might be expressing and where it's appropriate to express their personal views, where it's appropriate to express their professional views. So I think a lot of the fear and that was there initially around these things has started to die, uh, die away quite rapidly. And we're now getting to a fairly mature state where people are actually starting to use these things in a much more mature and, dare I say, innovative way to actually start to think through problems. Um, let me give you a couple of examples, at, uh, one example in particular that uh, where we've tried to take on board these ideas around innovation and the use of technology in particular to assist in, in innovation. And um, people, I don't know if people can remember the head of the game, people who were the public service, federal public service probably remember the head of the game, which was the, uh, the blueprint on the APS. And uh, one of the key themes in that was around moving forward on uh, citizen-centric services and trying to integrate service delivery across the Commonwealth Government in particular to a much greater extent than we have in the past. And that's not new. Uh, people have been saying that for donkey's years and a lot of people in this room have probably done some work on it. Um, but whilst there had been a lot of aspiration, there had been little, very little practical sort of work around that other than perhaps through the creation of the Department of Human Services bringing together Centrelink, Medicare, Child Support Agency, etc. And so um, we were given the task in finance, I don't know why, but we were, um, to actually try and bring this together from a whole of government perspective, to actually try to nut through what it is that stops people inside government working together on a common set of issues and to come up with a common solution, uh, which uh, has a, lot, a high degree of uh, technology attached to it, but that at the end of the day has a whole lot of um, goodwill and capacity to think through issues in a, uh, as I said, a, a way that is across government rather than from a more in, in an introspective viewpoint from the perspective of their own agency or their own part of the agency. And we've actually, cracked some stuff on this in the last couple of years. Our Department of Human Services is now providing a reliance framework, which is enabling people, citizens out there in the community to tell the government once about some aspects of their lives. So rather than telling the tax office about their date of birth and their address, and then t telling Centrelink 15 times uh, over a period of years, they can tell government once, gets recorded, and is available across a series of spheres. Early days, but I think it's a really good example of where we've been able to use innovation and link it with technology to actually improve citizens' lives and indeed provide for more efficient government. Um, the second one I might mention is, is, is around this is Web 2.0 and, and uh, sorry, the Gov 2.0 and it's not so much around the things I mentioned like blogs and data.gov.au and those sorts of things, but it's really around the culture uh, of, of uh, innovation and I think the thing we miss sometimes when we think about this is that if you don't have the right culture within the public service, you are not going to make a lot of progress. So what do I mean by culture? I mean a culture, and I think Mick mentioned this to some extent as well, a culture that enables people to be creative, gives them permission to be creative, gives them permission to make mistakes, gives them permission to experiment, gives them permission to talk to the outside world without fear or favour, those sorts of things that you'd need to create inside an agency if you're really going to have an innovative culture that is able to push things forward, push the boundaries a little bit and take some steps forward. Sometimes it's one step, uh, two steps forward, one step back, uh, but that doesn't matter much as long as it's going forward across the, the totality of things over, over a period of time. So I don't think you can underestimate this issue of culture. I think it's absolutely critical. You know, all the technology in the world and all the, all the sort of, you know, government statements in the world, but unless there's a culture of innovation and an allowance for risk inside an organisation, you're not going to get too far. I might stop there. Thank you very much. Um, we've um, heard some amazing sort of thoughts in terms of reinforcing what's come through today in terms of innovation, but also some of the both challenges and predictions around the disruption, I guess, of sort of social media and access to information and perhaps a sort of organised chaos, was that right Mick? And also the sort of pursuit of links between innovation, open data, open government and citizen engagement. So I suppose the sort of question really is sort of are we ready for these changes and what's the role of the public sector in coming to terms with this disruption? And perhaps there are people in the audience who are actually keen to explore some, some of those points. Yes.
Do you want to start? Yeah, look, brief comment. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, uh, I'll chance my arm and say I think we're getting a bit better at it. Uh, I don't think we're brilliant by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but uh, often the consultation that has occurred hitherto has been after the event. So it's more about here's the policy. Um, we might consult you to see how we implement it. Uh, I think we're m moving, that's good by the way, it's not worth doing, but I think we're moving a step further over time by actually getting people involved in consulting about what the policy change might or might not be, so thinking about the ideas. So, so the things I was talking about, the blogs, uh, the consultation processes that occur online uh, to a much greater extent than they have in the past, I think are all positive in that. Um, so, um, yeah, your point's a well-made one, and I think you may, be, may differ, but I think we're getting a little bit better, but there's a long way to go. Um, I presume you work for a commercial organisation. Yeah, right, okay. Well, no, no, let's talk about that because if you come and see me and we have a good discussion about our ideas and you throw me your, your best ideas and, and I get excited about it in government, the chances are that one way or another you're not going to be able to bid for the work which sounds to me pretty silly. So, so one of the things that we have to find is places to talk what I call sand pits. In the IT area, um, in the ACT, one of those sand pits is the government cluster out of NICTA that Mike Phillips and, and I and many others are, have developed. And that's a place where we're not competing with a procurement process, but we're dealing with questions that we don't actually know the answers to. And the ability to find places to do that with little bits of money, I think is what we need more of across the board, not just ICT. I spend a lot of my time promoting open access, open dialogue, open information, collaboration. But um, equally, um, one has to accept the realities of decision making that when it comes to difficult stages in deciding upon a policy or decision, um, it's ever been that um, a few people will want to sit in a room um, with the confidence of others in the room and strike an agreement. And that won't change. And the best example of that is the Cabinet. Um, that you know, it, it functions uh, on the principle that people can walk into a room, they can have a conversation of a kind they could have outside, but it occurs only because of complete agreement between everybody in the room that the conversation occurs only in the room. So there are many points in government when that will be the dimension. So what we've got to look at is building other processes around that to ensure, for example, that the decision they make in that room becomes known afterwards and becomes explained um, so that it can be discussed. And next time a decision comes up, uh, there's an opportunity to, um, to, uh, to require that the, uh, the, the, the definitive papers on which these decisions are based uh, um, a public at an appropriate stage, um, that there are you know, different styles of, uh, of government uh, announcements, papers, blogs and, and discussion. So I think you can create other processes around it um, that, uh, that won't remove you know, that isolation of decision making but will improve transparency in government overall. I guess the question is whether we'll have a crowdsourced, self-generated policy-making machine that governments will have to respond to at some point. And, and that's not actually so far away as to be ludicrous, um, but, but um, there are examples around the world of the way in which wikis have actually been used by governments. I think, Nick, you've um, helped the ACT government do a Twitter cabinet, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, the, 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 uh, the citizens are on the move. Um, was there any, any other comments? Maybe, look, I'll just very quickly add to that, because I've spent a lot of my time in the private sector trying to sell uh, to government. And, and my, you know, as a, as a market, my account management was to go and try and talk to the CIO and then try and eke out the secrets that the CIO held about how much funding they had to do what particular thing. And I think this is part of the model that's, that we're inverting now in this, this new era. And, and the value proposition that, the, that you can bring into the public service now is much more powerful and much better in that you can come in 
uh, as a key player in the information marketplace, in the service marketplace, with a solution. Uh, and so I think the role is to, is to do that right to left thinking and, and you come in with a service already in mind and all you really need is some data, is, is the information from the government and you can provide that, that, that packaged service and that's a solution. So the government doesn't have to buy a project, it can buy a solution and that, that really is a very strong value proposition. And I think the mood, and as David's saying and the others are saying, Government's in the mood now to hear that sort of value proposition, I think. So I, I think it's a, if it's a, it is a different selling proposition now than it has been in the past. Okay, another question down the front. I think the ACT could answer this question. And, and I'll just repeat it for the live streaming. The question is, what will an, an incoming government do um, on open government policies and practice? <laughs> I think the, the open government is unstoppable. I mean, regardless of the particular policy directives that you know come in, and in terms of party politics, if you look at the the rhetoric coming out of Queensland and the commitment towards openness, and you know we were all watching, but the the notion is much bigger than any particular government at any particular time, and I think I personally think the that move towards openness is unstoppable. I too think there's an irreversible platform of the Freedom of Information Act, the Declaration of Open Government and the pressures of technology. But can I say that the pressures for sort of open data can come from, an open government can come from different sources. For example, most of the reforms that occurred recently at the national level in Australia were driven by Senator Faulkner in the first stages who came at it from a very traditional um, accountability of government transparency and government integrity and government perspective. Um, the open data initiatives in the US um, have been strongly driven by President Obama and the standpoint from which he has come is a belief in how technology can, can dramatically change the relationship between government and the citizen, partly because he relied so effectively on technology during his own presidential election campaign to engage marginal communities. The pressure for open government in the United Kingdom has come primarily from the Cabinet Secretary Francis Maud and the Prime Minister David Cameron, and the perspective from which they are coming in simple terms is that they inherited uh, an, ec an economy which they felt was going backwards and they thought, well, look, government's got this hugely valuable data source. If we release it, we can um, stimulate innovation across the economy. Now, uh, interestingly, the impetus for uh, the open data access policies in Australia have come from conservative governments in Queensland, uh, uh, New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, they've come from all of the perspectives I mentioned, including in part from the perspective I think that um, we can get smaller government by releasing government knowledge uh, and data and relying on the private sector to provide services and benefits that government can't. So open government touches so many bases now that I think there are real opportunities, whatever the government is, to look for the link to look for the wave um, uh, to catch and, uh, and develop, as I say, a more comprehensive open government philosophy in Australia. Thanks, John. Not sure I should be commenting on this, but I'll have a go. Um, look, I basically agree with you, John. I, I think there's certain elements there that, uh, that are um, you know, irredeemable thing. We're moving forward and, uh, and life will keep uh, moving forward on that basis. So, the fact that so many different governments around the world of all sorts of persuasions have adopted uh, policies around open government and for the various reasons which John's just explained, I think, you know, tell us that, uh, you know, this, this thing will keep on moving forward. So I don't have much for you. It'll chop and change a bit. There'll be differences of emphasis and so forth between uh, if there is a change of government. Uh, but I think we're on a, you know, a steady state going forward. 
And one last question. So the question is, how do we measure the impact and effectiveness of innovation? Who'd like to take that one? Yeah, you're speaking to a converted person here. Um, <laughs> I'm on a crusade across the public service to improve our evaluation techniques and use of evaluation, not just in relation to communication products, but about policies and programs. And uh, the Commonwealth Public Service used to have a very strong culture of evaluation if you go back to the 80s, early 90s. Where, um, and we also actually went overboard because we evaluated everything that moves and, uh, and gave it a bad name accordingly. Um, but evaluation is absolutely critical in terms of you know, trying to work through whether what you're doing is effective and efficient, uh, achieving the outcomes that are set down for it. Uh, and so we need to get back to that sort of approach, I think, and um, not be slavish about it, but uh, try and evaluate the things that really matter and, and work our way through that and be honest in what we do in terms of evaluations. If, if I can be a little bit uh, critical for a moment or controversial for a moment, I, my tend tendency to think is that um, a lot of evaluation done is um, self-justification at the end of the day and that people uh, get a consultant, if I can be so rude, uh, to write the report that they want written. And I think we need to be a bit more honest in the way we go about our evaluation and be open with the results that come out of that ev evaluation and have a mature debate about the results that come out of evaluations. But um, as I said, that's a bit of a personal crusade. There are different strands of open government and the measurement technique has to vary. The traditional model of open government was that a person could make an individual request for access to documents under the Freedom of Information Act. You can't measure. All you can have is a belief that that's a good process. So, um, I've seen evaluations. Some evaluations say that it strengthens government. Some evaluations say that it leads to greater cynicism in government because the story is always written up about government performing badly. Um, but there you rely essentially on anecdotes and, and belief. Um, um, proactive disclosure of public sector information. There are very good studies in Australia and internationally about the dollar value. Uh, um, for example, the Australian Bureau of Statistics used to sell its data um, on uh, restricted licensing terms. Now it makes it available on uh, sort of open access. You can download it, Creative Commons, use it and so on. And some of the studies they've done show that you get a three, four, uh, a three or four fold increase in the value to the Australian economy, to GDP, of having an open data policy. There's some very good studies of that kind undertaken, particularly in Europe, which show that public sector um, innovation um, s stimulates value. The other, the, th the middle way you can measure it, for example, um, a process measurement, for example, the Freedom of Information Act requ uh, in, in has an information publication scheme that requires government agencies to publish information in a standardised standardized form on the web. You can do a process evaluation of how well individual agencies are doing and whether they're meeting those standards. That will tell you something about the culture in the agency, but again, it requires you to do a little bit of a jump from the information that you've got before you. Uh, I'm a bit unfashionable on this subject. I mean, I think that um, I think that the work of, of Denning and and the work of Toyota factory line has been mis misrepresented, and I probably you know often misused in recent times to the point where we're almost developing this sort of fetish towards um, numerical evaluation. Um, I want to simplify it. I want to say the reason the public service exists, exists is to make things better. We need to define and ask the question, has this made it better or not, it, rather than getting too complicated and misusing and for our own justification often um, statistics. Well, um, I'm going to bring it to, oh, David, did you want to say something? bring it to a bit of a close and I know that I can't go back to my office without saying that innovation is messy. I know Alex Roberts will kill me if I don't say this. Innovation is messy. Using old-fashioned 
forms of innovation which actually know where you're heading to achieve what might well miss the things that are actually going to make a difference. So perhaps we need some of the developmental evaluation methods, not just the summative and formative ones that presume to know what the endpoint's going to look at before you've even started. That's not to negate the impact of the importance of actually measuring um, not the innovative stuff, but the sort of ongoing service and policy processes. Um, could you join me in thanking our esteemed panel for um, being prepared to have a talk about this sort of things and what an incoming government or the, ne the next few years might look like. So thank you very much. Back, back to the innovator of the year. <laughs> I, uh, I'm very happy to now, I guess, call to a close the end of GovCamp proper. Uh, so um, I thank you all very much, and, and please join me also in thanking Jane for uh, facilitating this wonderful panel.